filled this world with an incredible beauty. Open our eyes to see it and to see those gracious hands in all of your works. Help us to rejoice, O oh God, on this day as we celebrate our cross of marriage, the good parts of it, the not so good. Help us to hear the living word as the scriptures are read and proclaimed. And we will do our very best to worship you, the one true and only triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And together we say, Amen. Amen. Our worship begins with praise, moves to a time of confession. An acknowledgement of who God is leads to an admission of who we are. We saw in the silent confession, now let us open our hearts and minds to God with sincerity, humility, committed to being the people God wants us to be. I know 
that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in all their joy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
said to his disciples, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and they went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were very wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise ones took flasks of oil with their lamps. The bridegroom was delayed, and all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here comes the bridegroom. Come out and greet him. Then all those bridesmaids got out and they trimmed their lamps. But the foolish ones said to the wise ones, Give us some of your oil, because our lamps are giving out. But the wise bride's face, they said, No, then there will not be enough for our lamps. It's better for you to go to the grocery store and buy some for yourselves. And while they went out to buy the lamp oil, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the way of it, and then the door got shut. The Gospel of Christ, amazing and great. Amen. Welcome to children. Now by the power of God's Holy Spirit, may my words become God's living word in your ears. And as we do that, just know that somehow or another I managed to get allergies this year through these awful leaves. I'm not infectious, at least that's what my doctor says. If I pop out halfway, this might give it to all of you. <laughs> I'm doing my best. You know, one of the greatest gifts I think of our Protestant heritage and Protestant reformers was this rebirth, this resurrection of a very important theological truth that Jesus and Paul and the other apostles gave to the church 1,500 years before the Reformation ever came. And it's this idea of the priesthood of all believers. And by that, I mean the work of God, the work of Christ in the world gets done by all of us, not just the, you know, the seminary trained and ordained clergy. Jesus taught that every last single one of us is given gifts and graces by the Holy Spirit to keep doing what Jesus did. What did he do? He taught, he healed. He comforted and he delivered God's children from the chains that bound them. And it didn't matter, you know, it does not matter what side of these chancel steps that we sit on or how we are living or how much education we have. Jesus never said, you know, just let the clergy do it all. All of us, he said, all of us together, all of you will do greater work and more of it than I can ever do all by myself. The priesthood of all believers. We celebrate that today. That was part and parcel of our Reformation heritage and tradition. The onus is on us. It is on us to manage whatever gifts that God has given us to do Christ's ministry. It's different for everybody. It's different for me, different from all of you. The gifts of the Spirit vary. But, 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 there are at least three what I call big ticket gifts and graces that come from God that everyone gets to some degree or another and has to manage. And you know what they are. If you sat in these pews, our time our skills, talents, and our money, right? We're going to be preaching on these gifts over the next few weeks as we enter into our 2023 financial pledge campaign. But I want to begin today on this <clears throat> Reformation Heritage Sunday with the gift of time. Try to define The writer of Ecclesiastes, as we heard Arthur read a few moments ago, told us 2,500 years ago what most of us 
did not have in these over movies and days of ours. He knew the truth. There is a time for everything. There is a season for every matter under heaven. He figured it out. So I can't tell you the number of people in the last several years who have told me that time, not money, time has now become their most precious and limited resource. Time. And I don't think it matters if you're young or older in between, or if you're, you work part-time or full-time, or if you're retired. It just seems as if there is just too much to do, and there's not enough time to get it all done. Tempest fusion. Time flies, or time flees, time gets away from us, doesn't it? Doesn't it really? Of course not. It is the result of overscheduling, poor planning, overcommitment, lack of organization. That's the problem. This is for me. Think about that odd little story that Jesus told about ten lives ago. That's about eight to two to eight in my humble opinion, but we had a head in this story. And they were told well in advance to get ready for the big wedding. Five of them got busy planning, organizing, going to the store, getting everything together so that there would be no hiccups and no mess ups and no last minute dashes. Man, I've seen that right here on wedding days. Jesus focused on the five that were responsible to go get oil. Make sure there was plenty of light for the evening wedding ceremony. They sat on the duffs until the last minute. And then when they had to get one out, they go begging and pleading, borrowing the animal from someone else. And when they get back, Jesus said, well, the bridegroom had already shown up, and the wedding was in full tilt. Not a good look. Now I realize there's a whole lot of work, theological juice in that parable. But I do think it does speak to this issue of time management. And it gives us some very, very practical advice here. And it does say that for sure that time, like oil, there is a limited amount of it. But that it's not like there's plenty of it. We'll get it done. Don't squander precious time. I came nose to nose with this a few years back when this congregation gave me the gift of eight week long sabbatical. And I was instructed by the person over the session to park my brain and my body and relax. Well, easier said than done. I'm telling you, I had a crisis two weeks into the thing. It was triggered by withdrawal. Withdrawal from busyness. I was addicted to busyness. And my body and my brain and my emotions started to feel it when the business just wasn't there. My frantic busyness was not all about the hard work done well in a timely way, mind you. It was about a discomfort with idleness, a subconscious guilt trip laid on me by my overly industrious Protestant parents. I just always found ways to just keep moving, don't stop. Always, always doing, which isn't necessarily healthy. It's not noble. It's self-destructive. And many of us do it all the time. So those eight weeks of downtime helped me see that I was frankly just a poor steward of one of God's great 
I was guilty at the time. And on top of all that, I was missing a lot of really great soul enriching everyday stuff because I just crammed too much into a day or a week or a month or even a year, all of which has all kinds of negative consequences in the end. Time just would get away from me. So I made a decision right then and there to clean up my act and become a better steward, which is our church word for management, of the time that God gives me, which required me to start looking at my priorities, to reconsider them, to reprioritize them, to frankly thin out stuff that was no longer life-giving, to learn how to say no. Where I could, I had to bow out of commitments. Then I factored in time, every day, every week, to breathe and center down. Get outside, not to work in the yard, get allergies, but to be healed by this amazing natural world that just too many of us just look past every day and we rush around and you know, try to get to the next thing we're supposed to be doing. And then a friend and a colleague got sick. And before she died, she told me that she felt like she had missed too much during her busy, industrious, successful life. And that she felt like she had lived perhaps more fully and more deeply after her terminal diagnosis than she had all the years before. And then she said, don't do that. Don't let life get away from you. Tempest fusion. Now, I'm a, I'm a better student of time, but we're talking B material, not A. I'm a better steward of time. And all of you know, I get stuff done. But not always well or in time to men. But I'm better than I used to be. How about you? For you, is time a gift of God that just keeps on giving? Or is it a problem that just gets away from you? What are we to do? How can we become better stewards, managers of God's gift of time? Well, first I think that holding a real sense and awareness of the sacred gift of time can become a very powerful Christian witness in this crazy, anxious, and overly busy culture that we all live in. Managing time so that we can prioritize our commitments and, and our activities, but also so that we can prioritize time to enjoy life. It's crucial. The onus is on us. We've got to do it. We have to reserve that time as they say, the smell of roses and to restore our minds, our bodies, and our spirits and just stop being so stupidly busy all the time. Running from one thing to the next. Learn how to say no. Learn how to say no to your kids. It's not good. It's not healthy. It's destructive. All of this can serve to become a powerful, powerful testimony to the goodness and the generosity of God who gives us good and perfect gifts and graces. We can witness to the good news message of Jesus that friends, our lives, our worth is not measured by how busy we are or how committed we are or how many things are on our daily calendars. I don't know about you, 
when I pass from this mortal time-filled life into the next, and someone asks me what I did with all of my years and my months and my weeks and my days, even my minutes, I want as few regrets as possible. But that, the only way that's going to happen is if I am always together get serious now about it. It really does come back to stewardship. That theological word the church uses to talk about the gifts of God that are in our hands and our lives. Careful, thoughtful, balanced giving of our own little gifts of time, skills, and money. May we hear what the living Spirit of God is saying. And now, unto God, the Lord of time and history, unto the giver of life and ever good and earthly gift, be honor and glory today and tomorrow, even to the end of time as we know it. Amen. Let's stand.
and read the hearts of others whom we do not understand. You know the inward suffering of those whom we ignore. Open us, our eyes, our minds, and our hearts, and please teach us how to love with your love. Peacemaking God, we continue to pray for places of conflict and unrest in our world. May an easing attention come to those places where threats and violence are used to intimidate and dominate. May weapons be silenced and destruction and killing come to an end in Ukraine and in the devastating civil war in Ethiopia. God, may we stop our fighting and learn the ways to your peace. Freedom loving God, we pray for those in the world who search for a safe place this morning. Those who seek asylum, a place to rest, and perhaps a place to make a fresh start. Transform hearts of fear and intolerance into hearts that beat for a world which may one day be as fair and just and compassionate as you created it to be. God, our hopes and fears just a week away from midterm elections as our political rhetoric ramps up. Through all that divides us, our pride, our prejudice, our politics, we pray that your wisdom, your truth, and your passion for justice may win our minds and hearts this time around and make us more like the people you love and desire. And on this Reformation Sunday, we pray as well for the church, for congregations that struggle under the weight of limited resources, the lack of financial stability, of energy, of spiritual vitality. Strengthen your church, its life and work and ministry. We pray especially for this congregation, we thank you for its faithful past, for its compassion and commitment to your message of good news, and its welcome extended to all. Bless us, O oh God, that we might be light and hope and love at work for this community and in the world. And Holy One, we pray for those of this congregation whose needs continue to be before us. Our prayers are offered for Zoe, Linda, and Nina, for Barbara and Jim, for Grace and Georgiana. And for family and friends whose lives and circumstances are on our hearts and minds today. For each one, faithful God. In their weakness and weariness, we ask that you renew their strength. In their sadness and discouragement, may you restore their hope. In their sickness and pain, may they know that you are with them and for them. God, by your grace, may bodies be mended, minds set at rest, and spirits renewed, so that they and we may know the peace that comes through life in Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us with these words our prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And it is not a temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Beloved in Christ, let us pray and give thanks. 
the Lord our God, on this special day, we remember the complex legacy of our Protestant heritage. And for those reformers, great persons of faith, who taught us that it is by grace and faith alone that your kindness saves us. We give thanks to God for this legacy of the Reformation, for the resurgence of the humanities, the gift of reading scripture in our own language, and for the examples of those who resisted government overreach and the abuse of power, for those who stayed true to their conscience in the face of great loss and even death. God help us to carry these lessons with us, knowing that they came at a great price. Teach us, O God, that perhaps the greatest lesson of the Reformation comes to us from Calvin. Preserve us from our desire for earthly monuments. Keep us from wasting our precious time wringing our hands over ecclesiastical self-preservation. And redirect us from worshiping the past and enshrining our dead heroes. Oh God, you have called not just clergy, but all of us together to do Christ's work in the world. To that end, help us to rejoice in this wonderful legacy that we call our Reformation heritage. Help us to become a church that embraces our role in the public sphere and in our life together, make us ever closer likeness of your beloved community. Until then, O oh God, may we always be reformed and reforming, not as a principle in and of itself, but according to your living word that comes to us from your living spirit. We pray this in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ and his kingdom of peace. Amen.